right, sounds good. So, um, yeah, so I'm here today to talk about my research, which is kind of, or, or at least one of the focuses of my research, which is kind of like casting a new type of net. Um, we're really interested, I'm interested anyways, in leveraging eDNA um, for quantitative assessments in aquatic ecosystems in particular. So estimating census size is a critical, well, census size is really a critical parameter in ecology. It's a really important fundamental characteristic of populations. Um, that's important to just understand um, how ecosystems work. But estimating census size is notoriously difficult. Um, despite pretty remarkable progress in the last century on, um, you know, estimating census size, it can still be really costly and labor intensive to do. And it can also be very physically invasive for the study organisms themselves, often requiring their capture, tagging them, even taking you know, genetic tissue samples or tissue samples for genetic analysis. And, and for remote species and elusive species, just you know, forget about it. They're really hard to actually get a decent estimate of the abundance for. So this has led a lot of people to look towards molecular methods to provide a potential alternative to the traditional survey methods. And one thing that's kind of emerged in the molecular ecologist toolbox that shows potential for addressing this question is environmental DNA or eDNA. So eDNA refers to DNA particles found in an environmental medium. Now, preliminary studies have indicated that there actually can be a pretty strong correlation between eDNA and organism abundance in um, in a number of systems, excuse me. But notably, many of those studies were conducted in controlled laboratory settings. So I was really interested in the question, to what extent is this generalizable to natural ecosystem? So to address this question, I actually did a meta-analysis uh, where I examined the studies, statistically examined studies, published studies that looked at the relationship between eDNA concentration and density or biomass of organisms in an environment. I looked at studies that were conducted with a natural ecosystem and laboratory ecosystem. And I did, did indeed find that environmental DNA exhibited a consistent positive correlation uh, with abundance across all environments. Now it was very strong in laboratory environments with eDNA or abundance accounting for approximately 80, about uh, just over 80% of the variation in eDNA concentration observed across experimental replicates. In ecology, that's a pretty remarkably strong relationship and it indicates a strong functional link between the amount of eDNA in a system and the abundance of organisms. But when you looked at studies conducted in natural ecosystems, this relationship started to break down a little bit. It tended to get, it was still positive, but it was a lot weaker relative to laboratory environments with abundance explaining about somewhere between 50 to 60% of the variation in eDNA concentration observed across environments. Now, despite the fact that this was a consistent positive relationship, it led a lot of people to question whether or not eDNA can be used to reliably infer abundance in natural ecosystems. And to do so, I think we really need to start you know, bridging the gap between the amount of variation explained in laboratory environments and natural ecosystems. And I think the best way to do that is to start thinking about eDNA dynamics and the ecology of its production. So eDNA is generated by two major physiological processes, the excretion of metabolic waste material and the shedding of cells from the surface of an organism, from its skin, scales, and mucus. And so I was fundamentally interested in the question, can we improve our models by integrating the physiology of eDNA production into our sort of estimates of organism abundance? Now, a lot of research has demonstrated that ingestion and excretion, so basically the production of feces and urine, which are major contributors to eDNA production, they scale allometrically as a power function of the mass of an organism. This is a center, central tenet of the metabolic theory of ecology, which posits that that you know, physiological rates like metabolism and, and excretion can be expressed as a function of an individual of the mass of an individual raised to the power of a scaling coefficient b. The value of b is somewhere usually between zero and one, and as a general rule, the metabolic theory of ecology predicts that the value of b is going to be somewhere around 0 0.75. Now, a lot of research has demonstrated that excretion rate coefficients are typically lower. A, a meta-analysis published in 2016, for example, found that the value of b was somewhere around 0 0.68 for nitrogen and invertebrates, but fundamentally excretion can be modeled using this sort of framework. Now, it's a really mathy way of thinking about things. What does this mean in practical? 
term. Well, basically, the metabolic theory of ecology predicts, based on these types of equations and, and, and frameworks, that a single large fish is going to excrete less waste than equivalent biomass of smaller conspecifics. So to kind of highlight what I mean by that, I want you to take these two groups of fish pictured here on the screen. We have a really large individual at the top and a whole bunch of small individuals at the top, at the bottom, sorry. Let's imagine that both of these groups have the exact same biomass. The metabolic theory of ecology would predict that even though the biomass of these groups of organisms is the same, the group on the bottom would actually excrete significantly more total waste product than the individual pictured at the top. Well, that's one process involved in eDNA production. What about shedding? Well, shedding is likely also linked to the metabolic rate of an organism and its physiology, its basic sort of physiology rates, but it's also predominantly probably a function of the total surface area of that organism. Now, a lot of research has generated that surf or a lot of research has demonstrated that surface area actually also scales allometrically and can be modeled using the exact same framework. Modeling surface area as a function of individual mass of an organism raised to the power of a scaling coefficient b. Not only that, but the value of b actually tends to be pretty similar to um, what's observed for excretory processes. The value of B in Salmonids, for example, is 0 0.59 to 0 0.65. So given that both physiological processes that produce eDNA scale allometrically according to the same formula, we developed a hypothesis that eDNA production is also going to scale allometrically according to the same type of model, that we can express eDNA production as a function of the individual mass of an organism raised to the power of a scaling coefficient b. In functional terms, we're predicting that a single large individual is going to produce less eDNA than an equivalent biomass of smaller conspecifics. And this is really interesting because when you start thinking about this at a population level, it, it's, it's very possible that size structure variation might actually end up influencing population level eDNA production rates. And that's because size structure variation in natural populations is ubiquitous, both within a population, but also even between populations. These two fish pictured here are both brook trout and they're both adult individual reproducing adult individuals in their respective populations. It just so happens that in one population they tend to be on average orders of magnitude larger than in the other. And so we we further developed a hypothesis that allometric scaling in individual eDNA production will scale to affect population level eDNA production, particularly when substantial size structure variation occurs. And so we made the prediction that incorporating allometric scaling will significantly improve models of eDNA particle concentration and organism abundance in nature when this type of size structure variation is, 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 uh, occurs among populations. So to test this hypothesis, we conducted whole lake experiments where we quantified the abundance of brook trout in nine lakes in the Rocky Mountains. We did this using annual mark recapture um, techniques to get uh, an estimate of abundance, and we also collected standardized size structure data by conducting basically you know, mixed mesh gill, nets net, gill net sets, Ooh, that's a hard one to say, um, and uh, basically just standardized index netting. Uh, and then we also collected eDNA samples from the littoral, littoral and pelagic zones of each lake to kind of calculate an average lake-wide eDNA concentration. We then estimated the amount of trout eDNA in these samples using quantitative PCR or qPCR. And we used a brook trout specific primer probe combination developed by Taylor Wilcox in 2013 that targets the mitochondrial cytochrome B gene sequence. The other handy thing about this study system is that there is indeed a large amount of body size variation amongst our study population. We had two lakes with very large bodied fish, four with medium bodied fish, and three with small bodied fish. So it, it was a good gradient of population, both population abundance and organism body size. How do we integrate allometry into our metrics of abundance? Well, traditional, uh, it's really important to think about the, or sorry, it's a, um, a key point here is that traditional metrics of abundance, which are, de are, are typically density and biomass. So density refers to the numerical abundance, how many individuals total there are in an environment, regardless of their size. And biomass refers to the total mass of all individuals present in an environment. These are the sort of traditional fisheries metrics that people are interested in. Now, you can actually express density and biomass as two extremes on the same sort of mathematical spectrum. Density can be expressed as a sum of individual mass values raised to the power of zero. And that's because any number raised to the power of zero is one, is equal to one. So in this kind of hypothetical lake, we could take all those fish, um, you know, raise those their individual mass values to the power of zero, sum the resulting of ones, and in a very roundabout 
needlessly complex way, um, we can estimate density just by summing those one values. Similarly, we can estimate biomass by taking the sum of individual mass values and raising, to, raising them to the power of one. Uh, and, and that's because any number raised to the power of one is equal to itself. So to calculate biomass, we would just take all those individual mass values raising to the power of one and sum the resulting totals. And again, in a roundabout way, estimate the biomass of fish present in this lake. But what we're really actually doing when we express density and biomass using this sort of uh, mathematical formula is we're actually expressing them uh, as a function of individual mass raised to the power of a scaling coefficient. It just so happens that zero and one, course, or density and biomass correspond to special cases of the scaling coefficient value with density corresponding to a scaling coefficient value of zero and biomass corresponding to a scaling coefficient value of one. So to integrate allometry into eDNA production, all we actually have to do is take these individual mass values, raise them to the power of our eDNA production scaling coefficient, and then sum the resulting totals. And this would give us what we refer to as our allometrically scaled mass. But what value should we actually use for B? This is really the, this was really the, when we published this study, this was the first study that actually kind of conceptualized um, eDNA production using these types of frameworks. We actually have no idea what the value of B actually is, but I think we could make some pretty edu decent educated guess based off of existing theory. The metabolic theory of ecology predicts that the value of B is going to be somewhere around 0 0.75, for example. We thought we might be able to do a little bit better than that, so I went digging in the literature and I ended up finding a study on brook trout that demonstrated that metabolic rates scaled with the power of um, 0 0.73, or the value of B anyways was 0 0.73. So that's what we used in our model when we calculated allometrically scaled mass. And indeed, looking at our sort of allometrically scaled abundance metric really significantly improved the fit between eDNA and organism abundance in our study lakes. And it did so in the exact way we would predict it to by basically reducing the expected eDNA contribution of large bodied fish. To illustrate this, I wanna draw your attention to the middle graph, which shows the relationship between biomass and eDNA concentration in these lakes. These two highlighted points are the lakes that have the largest negative residuals. What that means is that there's less eDNA in those lakes than you would expect based off of the biomass of fish present in those lakes alone. Notably, those two lakes are the lakes inhabited by large-bodied individuals that I mentioned before. And so when we look over on the right to our sort of allometrically scaled mass eDNA relationship, you can see that those two points actually um, are using allometrically scaled mass sort of penalizes those populations for having large-bodied fish and in so doing shifts those points back towards the mean regression line. One thing I want to note is that the strength of the correlation we observed in our study was actually kind of comparable to what's typically observed in laboratory experiments. Now, we have an N of nine, so I have to acknowledge that. I think to some extent we probably did get lucky. I, I, if I were to guess, my guess would be that the value of B would be somewhere around actually a little bit lower than what we saw. Um, it'd be somewhere around 0 0.65. And I don't know if we would get a stronger relationship if we duplicated this again, all important caveats. But I think that this is a good indication that, um, you know, taking into account population size structure might help um, might help explain some of this discrepancy observed between natural and laboratory environments. And, and there's good reason to believe that this would be the case because laboratory environments typically use single cohorts of fish when they're conducting their experiments. You'll typically hatch up a cohort of fish and throughout their entire lifetime, you'll conduct a series of experiments on them. And when it comes to doing eDNA experiments like these eDNA abundance relationships, usually in, um, people are using these sorts of single cohorts. And that means th these are fish that have been you know, fed the same amount, exposed to the same exact conditions all their entire life, and they're the same age. And while there might be some variation in body size within an experimental replicate, they're all gonna be pretty much, pretty close to the same size. So to generate gradients of biomass or density in these experiments, people typically will just take a fish and to you know, get more biomass or more density, they'll just add more fish of the same cohort. And so under these circumstances, you would not expect any kind of allometric relationship because they're all the same body size. And so you would expect to see a strong functional correlation between organism abundance and eDNA concentration because you don't even need to worry about allometry if you've designed your experiment this way. Uh, but if this, this is not really the case in natural ecosystems, as I stated before, size structure variation is pretty much ubiquitous in natural ecosystems. And so I think that 
accounting for size structure is going to explain at least some of this gap um, observed between natural ecosystems and laboratory environments. So we actually went a little bit further than a uh, with our study, um, we ended up getting this nice relationship, but we, we, we were wondering whether we might be able to use this relationship to predict abundance in, in a 10th lake. And there was actually a convenient um, study system in which we could actually do this uh, when we were conducting our experiment. Hidden Lake is a lake that was inhabited by invasive brook trout in, in, in Banff National Park. It was very in very close proximity to our other study lakes, which were located in Kootenay and Banff Park, Park as well. Now, Parks Canada wanted to get rid of those brook trout because they were invasive and, and they just wrote known the whole lake. So they poisoned and killed everything in it in August 2018. Before they wrote known it, though, we went in and collected eDNA samples. Now, we don't have size structure data for this lake, so we don't know how big the fish are in it, but we do know that it's been intensively netted for seven years because they were trying to get them out and eradicate them using netting. What that means is that those fish were tiny because they've killed all the big ones, right? They're just being replaced by smaller individuals each age class, They're very small fish. So we use the Olive Lake size structure data um, as a kind of proxy because Olive Lake in, in our original system of nine study lakes was the smallest one or, or was inhabited by the smallest body of fish. Now, based off of our model, we predicted that Hidden Lake is going to have an ASM value of 4,279. Now, translating ASM into biomass and density is a bit of a process, involves some a decent bit of math that I'm not going to get into for this presentation. But based off of that ASM value, we predicted that the density of brook trout um, that we would observe in Hidden Lake would be equivalent to about 540 individuals per hectare with a total population size of about 3,286. That was our point estimate anyways. Parks Canada did a census estimate after they wrote known the lake based off of the number of fish corpses that they collected. And they predicted that there would be somewhere between 3,300 and 5,000 brook trout in that, present in that lake prior to them applying rotenone to it. So I think that's pretty good, honestly. We undershot a little bit, but you know, we're on the low ball end of things, but for you know, a day of eDNA sampling, I think that's actually pretty decent. I will note though, that our prediction intervals were pretty wide, which is gonna be the case when you only have a relationship with a sample size of N or an N, a sample size of nine to, to predict something with. Um, you know, our prediction intervals range from zero to about 1,250 individuals per hectare and zero to 25 kilograms of biomass per hectare. But very interestingly, this still actually allowed us to do some quantitative comparisons with our original nine study lakes. We can confidently say that um, Hidden Lake has a lower biomass per hectare than um, at least four of our nine study lakes. And this is using a pretty strict prediction interval criteria too of a 95% uh, prediction interval. Maybe something like 75 to 80% might be good enough for most managers if they're interested in just kind of an initial screening pass using something like eDNA. Well, well that worked pretty well, surprisingly. Um, <laughs> we were pretty pleased with that result. So it's, it's interesting to think about how we might be able to improve our model further by further integrating sort of the physiology and ecology of eDNA production. And I think the next big step is going to be to integrate the effect of temperature on eDNA production. Temperature is a really important environmental parameter for eDNA because it can affect both the degradation and its production. Fish are poikilothermic organisms, which means that their key metabolic rates and eDNA is fundamentally a physiological metabolic eDNA production is fundamentally a physiological metabolic process. Um, but but don't as poikilotherms, the external temperature of their environment really has a strong impact on these key meta metabolic and physiological rates. And to demonstrate this, I want to kind of show this graph here, which is something that's drawn from a study conducted in 1991 that describes a bioenergetics framework used to model the proportion of maximum consumption, which is a fancy term for basically saying feeding rate, of coho salmon. And you can see that it's highly dependent on temperature. Now, what goes in must come out. So I'm, I, in, a, in a recent publication, I basically proposed that I think that we can basically take these bioenergetics modeling frameworks and apply them to eDNA production. Um, it's basically a temperature dependency function. So I think we can use these, extend these bioenergetics frameworks to model the temperature dependency function of eDNA. And in that way, be able to integrate it into our equation um, to sort of look at this relationship between organism abundance and eDNA concentration. And interestingly, I think we have some circumstantial evidence anyways, uh, or preliminary evidence in our study system of nine lakes to indicate that temperature may be explaining some of the remaining variation. 
I want to highlight this point right here, which again is the largest negative residual in our sort of ASM uh, eDNA concentration relationship. Now the other eight lakes, the temperature of those lakes was between nine and 16 degrees Celsius when we took them, when we collected eDNA. Or sorry, this is the one with, that has the largest negative residual. So again, less eDNA than we would expect based off of the abundance of fish alone. So let's take a look at the temperature dependency function here, which is for another cell mounted, but it, so it's gonna be similar to what you would probably expect for brook trout. When you look between eight and about 16 degrees, there's not a ton of variation in terms of what they're gonna be feeding or their total feeding rate. Now to go back to the graph here, the single data point is Temple Lake. This lake was four degrees Celsius when we sampled it. It was real cold when we actually went in and sampled it. And when we go back to our uh, you know, um, temperature dependency function for consumption rates, you can see that at four degrees Celsius, consumption rates drop off dramatically. So these fish are just probably eating less. And I think that's gonna account, that might um, account for that sort of large negative residual that we have associated with that ecosystem. So that was an example of intraspecific allometry in eDNA production, but and, and while size structure variation is ubiquitous both within species, both within a population and across populations, when you actually look at interspecific variation in size structure, it's even more important and it's even more ubiquitous. You know, fish display an amazing diversity of body forms. You can go all the way from tiny little dace and chubs, you know, creek chubs up to brook trout, up to tuna, and at the extreme end of things, a whale shark. There is a remarkable diversity in terms of body size when you look at things across species. And I think there's good reason to believe that allometric scaling, these sort of allometric processes are gonna affect things at an interspecific basis as well. If you recall that uh, metabolic rate uh, or the metabolic theory of ecology actually was developed to describe these processes at an interspecific level originally. And um, when, if you recall that graph I showed pictured here earlier that was associated with um, a nitrogen excretion allometric scaling factor of 0 0.68, that actually was an interspecific study. It was looking at how excretion scaled across species. And so we, develop, we further hypothesize that eDNA production is gonna exhibit the same sorts of patterns, that eDNA will exhibit interspecific allometry as well. So to test this hypothesis, we went out and analyzed a previously published data set. Um, we applied our sort of allometric framework to a New Jersey marine um, eDNA survey, which basically compared the uh, number of metabarcoding reads assigned to each species from eDNA samples versus their abundance assessed from traditional trawling data. And we use Bayesian models to estimate what the, the value of this sort of B parameter will be. And we ended up finding that B, it, what we ended up finding was actually very close to what you would expect based on theory. Interestingly enough, our point estimate for the value of the allometric scaling coefficient was 0 0.67. And you can see that pictured here in the middle. And so to, I, I just, this is going to be, I'm going to hope this works. This is going to be the first gift that I ever present in a, uh, oh, sorry about that. First gift that I ever present in a scientific pre uh, presentation. So it seems to be working, which is great. Pretty pleased with that. So, um, I wanna show you how integrating allometry can linearize or help linearize anyways, this data is still pretty messy because of metabarcoding, um, help linearize the relationship between organism abundance and eDNA concentration. So if you recall before, density corresponds to an eDNA scaling coefficient value of zero, biomass bio corresponds to an eDNA production scaling coefficient value of one. And, and, every, and the values in between going from zero to one are kind of intermediate. And so, you can see here on this graph, I'll let it reset here, or on this GIF. So this corresponds to what the relationship looks like with the scaling factor of zero or density. And as the scaling factor value increases to 0 0.67, you can see that the relationship becomes more linear and then it starts to break down as we approach biomass again. Um, so this is just kind of, hopefully illustrates how integrating allometry can help linearize these relationships. It's metabarcoding data, so it's still kind of messy. Um, well, I will uh, 
I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a slide or two. Oh, I want to have a chat about what the long-term prospects for using eDNA are to infer abundance. I think there's a large amount of skepticism for the inference of abundance from eDNA concentration. And I think it's going to be important moving forward for the field to define goals. Are we interested in these kinds of qualitative comparisons or are we interested in quantitative? In I apologize. I'm going to have to just pause for a second. I have to take this phone call. This is an intermission. I really apologize for that. <laughs> it's okay, Matthew. It gave us a chance to all get some popcorn and get back to the seminar. So uh, take it away. Excellent. All right. So where was I? Field needs to define goals, qualitative versus quantitative. So when I talk about qualitative goals, what I'm really, um, what I really mean is kind of looking at things from the framework of looking at, uh, or of trying to estimate whether a population is like say high, medium or low abundance, or maybe alternatively, whether or not a population is say above a critical conservation threshold. So eDNA might be able to, for example, tell you whether or not a population is, you know, critically low or, you know, can we can be reasonably confident that a population is, you know, within sort of safe conservation levels. In terms of quantitative prediction, what I really mean there is whether or not we can actually use eDNA to predict the number of fish present in a population. So, you know, being able to look, say what, and, and, and in terms of quantitative goals, I think we need to look at and discuss what level of precision we need. So do we need kind of ballpark estimates? So could we use eDNA to say, oh, maybe there's between 1,000 and 3,000 fish present in Lake A, and there's between you know, 200 and 1,200 fish present in Lake B, or are we interested in high precision estimates? You know, We need to know that there are exactly 3,000 fish in, in Lake A and exactly 800 fish in Lake B. And, and to kind of illustrate why this is important, I wanna compare eDNA to sort of other traditional method, uh, like a counting fence. Now, counting fences are, remarkable pieces of um, infrastructure for getting census size estimates. They're basically put up on streams and rivers to, count, uh, to count the number of migrating anadromous or patadromous fish moving within that system, usually typically during reproductive runs. They will give you information down to the last individual fish that goes up that stream. They give you excellent, very precise and accurate data. Counting fences cost a lot of money though. It costs a ton to install it, it costs a lot to maintain it, and they're very labor intensive. Somebody has to be going down and moving those fish every single day um, in between the bottom and the top of the, of the counting fence. eDNA, conversely, you just basically go in, collect, I don't know, 20 samples, and then it can give you some data. The advantage of eDNA is in its cost efficiency. eDNA is never, I just want to be clear about this, eDNA is never going to give you the level of precision and accuracy that you can obtain with the counting fence. It's just unrealistic to expect otherwise. But for kind of a rough, rough and quick and dirty estimate of abundance, I think the eDNA actually shows pretty decent promise. And so I think it's also worthwhile to talk about the two different ways eDNA um, data is kind of analyzed and the two different approaches used to analyze it, which is metabarcoding and um, QPCR and DDPCR and how they relate to these sort of qualitative versus quantitative objectives. Metabarcoding is typically employed to survey community biodiversity. For a number of reasons that I'm not going to get into here, into the details of um, metabarcoding is only going to be, the, the quantitative number of reads you obtain from metabarcoding is only going to be correlated with the concentration of, the original concentration or, of template environmental DNA in your sample. And so I think the best we're ever going to really get with metabarcoding is probably these kinds of qualitative inferences. And I think we'll probably get there, but I don't think we're quite there yet. And I think to get there, we are going to need to start thinking about the ecology of eDNA and its dynamics and its environment. As I showed that integrating allometry, this sort of interspecific allometry can help sort of linearize, linearize the relationship. So, so once we start taking into account these, these different effects, because allometry isn't the only thing that's going to be affecting you know, the quantitative 
meta barcoding data you get. Um, once we start integrating these effects, I think we can start moving closer towards reliable um, qualitative abundance inferences. Now, digital um, droplet PCR and quantitative PCR, however, I think are very amenable to these types of analyses. QPCR and DDPCR provide high precision, absolute quantification of the exact amount of eDNA con or the concentration of eDNA present in your environmental samples. And I think research is emerging right now that we're basically at the point where we might be able to make qualitative comparisons using QPCR and DDPCR. DDPCR approaches. A, a, a paper published in, in, in Environmental DNA Journal, for example, um, by Mike Spear demonstrated that, yeah, they actually could pretty reliably predict whether or not um, walleye populations were above sort of a critical low threshold between fishable and non-fishable um, just by sampling eDNA. So again, I think that's pretty good. And I think a key question moving forward for the field is can we move from these kinds of qualitative inferences that I think we're pretty much at the point where we could do with QPCR and DDPCR to more quantitative inferences. And I think that the way to do this is by integrating eDNA dynamics. So thinking about its production, its degradation, and its transportation in natural ecosystems. And I think that eDNA is showing promise for this. Um, you know, I don't think we're there yet where we can reliably infer quantitative values, but I think it's promising. And to highlight this, I just want to, again, revisit the, the fact that using our sort of nine study lakes, we were actually able to make pretty decent predictions about the total amount of biomass present in Fish Lake. We can quantitatively say that there is probably less biomass of fish present in that rotenone lake, hidden lake, than there were in four of our nine study lakes. For a single day of sampling where we went out and collected a dozen eDNA samples on the lake and then spent another day in the lab analyzing, I think that's pretty good. Um, so with that, I'd like to wrap it up. I'd like to thank all my collaborators um, who worked on these studies with me, and as well as my current supervisors, uh, Dan Heath at the University of Windsor and Nick Mandrak at the University of Toronto, and, um, and all the huge list of folks who have helped with all these different studies. And uh, yeah, I'd be happy to, happy to take any questions.